Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Sally. Welcome to the Unitarian Universalist Congregation of the Swannanoa Valley. I'm Sally Smith and I'm a member of the Board of Trustees. We are a welcoming congregation with no particular creed, but we are guided by our mission statement, which is printed on the front of your order of service, and by eight principles, which are printed on the inside of your order of service. If you are new here and would like to learn more, please fill out a white card that should be in your pews, either inside a hymnal or in the little things that are in the back. Danny's holding one up there. <laughs> um, and you can drop that in the collection plate or you can um, leave it out in the foyer. Someone will pick it up and we will get in touch with you the way that you prefer um, whatever you put on the card, if it's email, great. If it's phone call, whatever, we'll get in touch with you the way that you prefer. Um, we have a couple announcements before we get going today. Um, let's see. One is from Larry. Larry, wave your hand wherever you are. Oh, he's way back there. Okay. Wow. Um, he said, please make this announcement. Those interested in a Friday potluck plus the movie Crash, which explores the issues of racism as well as serendipity, see Larry Perlman. And then in your other email, you also said that it was on the 27th, Friday the 27th, is that right? Yes? Okay. Um, and also, Larry wanted me to tell you that in the current, his email was incorrect. Um, it's, Larry, just say it. <laughs> Otherwise, I gotta go to another email. It's Larry R. Perlman, people leave the R out of all the time. 42 at gmail.com. Okay. Um, another announcement is that on this coming Thursday, January the 12th, there's a women's group meeting at 5.30, um, and it's open to anybody um, in the congregation or visitors who identify as female. <laughs> yeah, and, uh, the last announcement is from Deb Vingle. Um, she's head of Building and Grounds. Um, communications committee met <coughs> last week and we decided to make some changes. Um, as some of you might have noticed, the, the bulletin board is gone out there. Um, the bulletin board will be coming back, but in a slightly different place. Plus, we're gonna be rearranging some other things. Don't get your knickers all in a twist because <laughs> it will all be fine but it's not done yet so just wait until everything is is uh, sorted out there in a few weeks okay um that's all for announcements um for visitors it's our tradition to have visitors stand and introduce themselves um if you're comfortable doing so and tell us where you're from um and you don't have to necessarily necessarily be brand new that you might just have been away for a while. Um, is there anybody on this side who would like to stand and introduce themselves? No one? Okay, how about on this side? Hi. Hi. I'm Malin and I have been coming for a few months but I come and go so I, I don't look very familiar so I'm <laughs> so glad to be here. So welcome. welcome. I'm Leah, and Hi. I have been trying to move to this area pre-COVID, so I've been here a few times, and I was here Christmas Eve, which was wonderful, and I did finally find a place, and I moved here from Indiana, so. That's us. Acknowledges with respect that the land we are on today is the ancestral home of the Cherokee and of other indigenous people. The Cherokee 
through stewardship, understanding, and conservation survived and thrived in this land. We acknowledge their enduring commit connection to their homeland. And with that, um, I just want to remind everybody to shut off your cell phones. And we will let our service begin. That was kind of a weak one. We're going to try that again. <laughs> Ah. Yeah. <laughs> then you have to wait really long before it starts. <laughs> well, Happy New Year. Happy, happy New, Year. New Year. It's a beautiful, great day. Good mm -hmm. to see your faces here. Um, I want to begin today's service with uh, it's a little longer, thanks Diane, a little longer opening words than we're used to, but I think it's real apropos. For the longing that told you it was a time for a change, we give you our blessings. For the courage it took to answer the call, we give you our blessings. For the choices already made and for the daily choices that will shape the life, the year uh, ahead of you, we give you our blessing. For the communities that have shown you who you are and the new communities waiting to discover you in your new ventures, we give you our blessing. For the great mystery of what lies ahead, 2023, we give you our blessing. We give you our blessings and our love. May you see something of beauty along the way. Touch hands with those you love and always give more than you get. So, thank you, Diane. Please stand as you are willing and able and join in singing the true words of this hymn. My life goes on. Hymn number 108. Thank you. It's called for you. 
The sum of all known reverence I add up in you, whoever you are. Those who are there for you, it is not you who are there for them. All architecture is what you do to it when you look upon it. All music is what it takes from you. The sun and stars that float in the open air, the apple-shaped earth, and we upon it. The endless pride and outstretching of people, unspeakable joys and sorrows. The wonder everyone sees and everyone else they see, and the wonders that fill each minute of time forever. It is for you, whoever you are, it is no farther from you than We consider Bibles and religions divine. I do not say they are not divine. I say they have all grown out of you and may grow out of you still. It is not they who give the life, it is you who give the life. Will you seek afar off? You surely come back at last and things best known to you, finding the best or as good as the best. says music has been part of her life since she began taking piano lessons at age seven when her mother got tired of hearing her trying to play <laughs> she sang in church choirs school and community choruses for many years and in 75 she taught herself to play guitar wrote songs and sang for church and community events also she worked as a music therapist in nursing <coughs> homes and led many sing-alongs and is still at it. <laughs> <laughs> so there's a, a little town up in the mountains in northern Arkansas called Eureka Springs. And it's kind of a tourist mecca now, but it, it used to be famous for its healing waters. And people would come from miles around and stay in the hotel to take the waters. And unfortunately, with time and with leaking septic systems and leaking oh, sewers, yeah pipes and so on, the water got polluted. And so the town had an event to raise money so that they could start to fix the situation. And these two young men, Don and Scott, and I never knew their last names, I don't even know what's happened to them now, but they wrote this song especially for this event. And this was maybe, I don't know, 40 years ago or something like that. And um, I think it's probably as relevant now as it was then, or even probably more so now. Healing water. She is the spirit in the song of the rain. She is the movement in the sun. The dance of the spring And though this living dance is never through Her spirit grows weary She is calling to you We must heal the water Give her a love Heal the water there's still time enough to give her back the sparkling color blue and give her the purity she once gave you. For she 
This is such a sad concern, and I hope I can have your thoughts. My sister-in-law's family in California, the mother got a dog, and she loved the dog. And the father was the one who cared for their son who almost drowned in a swimming pool 20 years before. The mother was out walking the dog. The dog pulled her too hard, and she fell and broke her femur mm -hmm. and landed in the hospital. While she was in the hospital, her husband collapsed and died. Oh, oh my God. God. So I, I would, I would the, the good side is that her daughter is moving from Florida back to California to be with her family. So there will be a happy ending, but I would like to have your thoughts and love yeah. for this yeah. family. have a joy or a concern, but I, <laughs> um, I found a photograph that I hadn't seen for 15, 18 years, and um, my former husband and I were scuba divers, and 
I found this photo that meant a lot to me. I don't know if anybody saw how a barracuda moves. It's like, jip, 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 jip. Anyway, we both had underwater cameras and I got a picture of this one. And if you take a look at it, it's got a face that says, oh yeah, don't come by me. <laughs> so um, it was a very exciting experience and um, I'm glad I have this. Okay. Hi, Manny. And our last uh, 4th of July weekend, uh, Herb and I, I was going to say put our dog down, but yeah, I guess we put our dog down. We went to, uh, went to puppy heaven and um, in a beautiful ceremony. And um, since then, we both have missed her and missed having a dog. And I just couldn't take it, so I decided to um, to volunteer at Brother Wolf, mm -hmm. so that I could play with dogs without the responsibility and the commitment. Mm -hmm. So, as the universe had it, um, of course, I found the dog of my life, and I am now <laughs> we are now the proud parents of Walter. <laughs> Walter is a coonhound mix, and he's just he's wonderful. So. Um, our new, our new uh, family member, Walter. <laughs> Good morning, I'm Kathy Prosser. Some of you know my husband has pancreatic cancer. And two joys, and I shouldn't start like that, but we spent November at the Mayo Clinic in Minnesota, and he's doing really well. Yeah. So, So, um, the cat died in October, and then we both wanted a pet, so we went to Brother Wolf, and we too now own a rescue coon hound. Oh. <laughs> Dogs are very therapeutic. Yes. That's it. <laughs> What's his name? What's Maple. his name? Uh, Maple. Like Maple. 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 <laughs> <laughs> I'm Andy, and Andy. I, I live in a condo community in a six-plex unit, and three of my neighbors came down with COVID Ooh. this past week. Ooh. One is 89 years old, Ooh. and so just I'm keeping all of them in my thoughts and hope everyone will. Mm -hmm. Joy. I want to thank some of you have been doing this every year since I've been here and and I get it you know and I appreciate it but I just want to thank you for your generosity and for um, you know the good thoughts that come my way all year but especially between Christmas and New Year's Eve and uh, so when I work on abundance you guys make that really happen so I just want to say that from the bottom of my heart, I, I, I really do appreciate you sharing your resources. Um, we have a dog, <laughs> but I, I, I have no words. <laughs> it's been a challenge for me, um, but they are uh, wonderful people. <laughs> yeah. Wow. So anyway, <laughs> moving along. For those of you who, for whatever reason, decided not to come up and uh, to share, just know that we keep you in our thoughts and prayers and in our hearts. And, um, you know, we'll catch up with you. <laughs> or you'll catch up with us. <laughs> Thank you, Diane. I wanted to do this reading for um, the new year. It's called The Days Are So Full, A Mixed Blessing. Uh, and so here we go. Uh, we will have our usual time of quiet afterwards. 
but now I invite you to center yourselves in the way you see fit and uh, open your hearts and your minds to the thoughts of Richard Gilbert. <clears throat> Let us relax in the warm embrace of this community as we slow our lives to a more human pace. We come into this place of worship, yearning to alter the sometimes hectic nature of our days. Here we confess we often choose to do too much in too little time. In this quiet space, we acknowledge that our days are much too full. Here we are free to ask questions, to question even ourselves. We wonder why we have so overburdened our bodies and our spirits. Why we have overcommitted ourselves, not disciplined our energies or rationed our strength. It is not sometimes, is it not sometimes, because there is so much to interest us, so much, so much fascination in the world, so many intriguing people, so many compelling questions, so much that is worthy of our attention. Our days are so full, so full of challenge and temptation and so full of wonder and work, so full of questions without answers and answers without questions. In the blessed peace of this place and people, may we learn to focus our energies on the consequential and ignore the trivial, that we may enjoy <coughs> the fullness of our days. So now, while I got you, <laughs> with our minds being one, I leave you to the eloquence of silence. And so it is. That rain can just take you right away from here, can it? <laughs> anyway, uh, we have uh, it's time to ask for this one more. <coughs> This is uh, probably Kate Wolf's most well-known song. If you know it, if you know the chorus, you're welcome to sing along. Is what you're after. Open up your 
walk these mountains in the rain. I've learned to love the wind. I've been up before the sunrise just to watch the day begin. I always knew I'd find you, but I never did know how. But like sunshine on a cloudy day, you stand before me now. You must give yourself to love. If love is what you're after, open up your heart to the tears and laughter and give yourself to love. Give yourself to love. Love is born in Planted like a seed. Love can't give you everything, but it gives you what you need. Love comes when you are ready. Love comes when you're afraid. It'll be your greatest teacher, the best friend you have made. You must give yourself to love. Is what you're after. Open up your heart to the tears and laughter and give yourself to love. Give yourself to love. Give yourself to love. Give yourself to love. Thank you for your generosity. Okay. On many occasions, well not many, you've heard me stress to you my opinion um, about the importance of cultivating your inner or interior life. Um, that's what I think spirituality really means. If it's spirituality, you know, it can be too woo-woo because it's you so much, it doesn't really mean. It's like love sometimes. It doesn't, we use it so much, it doesn't mean anything anymore. But it's still important to do, to take the time to, to self-reflect, to not be so... Um, other aided, if you will, where everything is focused on what is going on outside and around you. Because otherwise you become a victim of circumstances, of your outer circumstances, and the inner life or inner consciousness will produce the outer experience, not the other way around. And we know that, right? It's a universal law, it's not personal, as within, so without. It's not the other way around. So by cultivating our inner life, we create what I like to call a cultured mind. By cultivating our way of thinking and feeling about life circumstances, we begin to develop and cultivate our inner landscape. This is the way I have developed years. Uh, and it's, it's a never-ending thing, but sometimes you get it and you just kind of hold on to it if you can. Um, the last three to five years, maybe more of my life, I've developed a sense of inner peace and equilibrium that helps me finish out the rest of my days on this planet and in this dimension. I, the Christians call it the peace that passes all of the understanding. The Buddhists have another name. But it's, it, it's, it's that, for the most part, nothing can really shake me for too long. I've also stressed what I feel is the importance of meditation and prayer. It, it has been said that to the mind that is still, 
the entire universe surrenders. Einstein said, I think 99 times and I find nothing. I stop thinking, I swim in silence and the truth comes to me. I have noted also, and many of you already do this and will probably did it before I was around, you, you're spending time in nature. It's a way to discover and work with the inner life, to discover the seasons of the self. Now, one of the challenges of doing this type of work is to decide just how much of the cultivated life you want to reveal. And what I mean is what you want to reveal, not you know to the world, but also to yourself. We wear our masks. And the problem comes when we forget that we're wearing masks, that, you know, we, we have this identity. You see it a lot with people after they retire, or maybe even, you know, my kids are going, what am I going to do? I used to do this, that, and the other, because we've confused our identity, ourselves, with what we do. So the question becomes, which one of those landscapes do you want to clean up, so to speak? Which one of those so-called landscapes is the real you? These landscapes may vary in appearance depending on you know, who you are, where you stand in life, and how you choose to present yourself. Choice is very important in life for, because basically life is a series of choices, made or not made. Not making a choice to do anything is still a choice. And it can be extremely deleterious to life, that, to the life that you're trying to lead. Whether you are ignorant of this fact or not, all is choice. And, and I, I'm, I'll paraphrase Carl Jung, who said that if you don't look at your shadow, you will call it fate. And then you will think, <coughs> that all these things are happening to you. I've been in relationships with people like that. Uh, uh, it's, it's, it's a journey. It doesn't make people bad, I, I'm not, because I'm gonna reveal some things to be vulnerable with you. After this sermon, you're probably gonna say, boy, Michael screwed up, isn't he? <laughs> <laughs> I wish I really looked at his background before he died. <laughs> First, there is the self, and, and so I'm going to use myself, but first there's the self that usually appears in talks like this. For any talk, you know, you get up. Uh, the self that I, or even you, wants others to see. This is the self, and I've used some flowery language, but don't let it deter you, just stay with me. But this is the self of, of majestic mountain peaks and meadows. This is the self of strength and power. This is the self of educational and career accomplishments, leadership skills, or the lack thereof, and the demonstrated commitment to service. This is the public self. The one that you and I, I, I know I do sometimes, but I'll suggest maybe you do too, struggle to hold on to. I'm not going to ask for a show of hands. <laughs> then there is the self that does not want to be revealed. This is the self that wants to hide. This is the landscape of weakness and vulnerability. There are many valleys and few peaks in this self. This is the self that, that we don't share with others. Or maybe we do as we become more authentic. But basically, it's, and I'm talking about the difference, I'm not talking about secrets, I'm talking about privacy. There are some things about my life that will always, for instance, be between me and my wife. I don't share that. But that's a difference between secrets. You know, good fences make good neighbors. Right? This is the self, though, what I'm talking about is I travel with in times of darkness, times of fear, through experiences of worthlessness and hopelessness. Yet I've come to realize that for me, can't speak for you, 
that this is the self that guides me to the places of the most true teachings for me to become more authentic and, and learning and grow. The very things I run the hell away from is what I need to hang in there with. In the landscape of this self, the topography includes places like um, the swamps of self-deception, overflowing with the waters of dishonesty, steaming with the fog of selfishness and reeking with the stench of egotism, venomous snakes of control of others, I know how to do that. And so do you. We do it with each other sometimes. And situations, procrastination, or being resistant to change. Sometimes just plain old laziness and lack of self-discipline. They breathe freely here. And quite often they, they threaten to eat me alive. Nearby, is the valley of self-doubt. This valley is littered with huge boulders of fear formed from anxiety about failing, held in place by the pebbles of insecurity. The ground is dry and parched from long droughts of shame and guilt. Nothing grows in this valley. It is littered with weeds of limitation and lack and fear, you know, sometimes Practicality disguises itself as fear. Well, actually, fear disguises itself as practice. I won't try that. <laughs> I give all these reasons. I'm practical, I'm logical, I'm a pragmatist. I'm afraid. I'm afraid. Uh, well, you can relate. This valley is, is littered with limitation and, and lack, and few peaks, uh, you know, happen here. The desert of anger, let's not forget that. The desert of anger surrounds the valley of self-doubt. It is heated by the unrelenting sun of self-hatred and resentment that gives rise to the hot winds of resistance and disobedience and competitiveness and arrogance. These winds create the sandstorms of jealousy and meanness and just good old fashioned envy. So there are places in this landscape that cannot be seen by the viewer. These are the underground caverns and caves of not being good enough and not worthy of the good that runs beneath the swamps and the valleys and the desert. These caverns underlie all of the self-destructive and non-productive scenes. It is only in the past several years that I have discovered how deeply these caverns and caves extend into my life. Perhaps that is why so many people do not do it. They, do, they don't venture within. Doesn't make them bad people. I always want to put that in there because people are in different paths on their journey. For some people, it's just too painful to look at their flaws. It's too painful. They're wounded, as we all are. Perhaps this is why so many people are so concerned with how other people are living. taking other people's inventory. Cahill Gibran reminds us that our worst fault is our preoccupation with the faults of others. <laughs> See, because then I don't have to look at me. <laughs> because you're screwed up, not me. <laughs> you're going to look at me differently after this. <laughs> so while, while beginning, no, and, and, and I joke, but I feel I can be vulnerable with you. We can be vulnerable with each other. But it's hard being a human being. I gotta tell you, I'm trying to be a good human being, put it like that. <laughs> so while beginning this work, this lifelong work, 
I found it extremely interesting that while I am easily able to identify the weaknesses I have in great detail, I am at times challenged to identify with my strengths. As you have strengths, my strengths. That is, there, there's, a, there's a third realm in the landscape of the self. It's not new, but it is a place I am learning to gradually know and accept. Perhaps you are too at this time in your lives. The third landscape is a place of beautiful, inspiring scenery. You see, I imagine this. And Einstein tells us imagination is, is really more important than intellect. Uh, uh, imagination is previews of life's coming attractions. <laughs> this third landscape is full of dreams and aspirations. It feels new at times because I've wallowed in this swamp of self-deception for so long, visited the cave of not good enough too often, so often in fact, that I lost sight of the right to dream, to aspire, to have goals, to say I'm worth it. I deserve the good that comes in my life. That some of it I created, I manifested. I now stand boldly 65 years in this new land, dreaming joy-filled dreams and devoted to this realization, I now can see lush, sunlit hillside terraces of hope, sandy white beaches of confidence, floral gardens of self-love, and mountains of faith in my ability to create what I want in this life. In this new place of dreams, I sing and dance with delight. I visit breathtaking sites of peace as I walk on an abundant earth, talking to the spirit of life in silence with telepathy. I now see myself learning new things, teaching new things, creating objects of beauty, loving others, and being loved passionately. But most of all, I see myself in a landscape of happiness, just as I am. And as I become, I am. In the landscape of dreams, there is a horizon of aspirations. They become clearer in this new third self. I see myself as a teacher, not of the former self, but of a new self becoming a new human being. I am a teacher willing to support others in their quest to connect with themselves and the world around them. And as I learn, I teach myself. I will share with others. I will teach the process that is written in the curriculum of my heart. And as I have learned it by walking through the desert and the swamp, the cave coming to a place of rest on the beach of devotion in the gardens of my dreams. Isn't it amazing that we go to so many dark places to find the light we've, already, we've always had? Isn't that something? I ran from myself only to find myself through seeking to help others. I see myself with more clarity now, warts and all. And that's what I want you to do. That's why I'm your minister. We're in it together, up to our you-know-what. <laughs> I see myself with more clarity. I'm devoted to use the gift that I have given, that I've been given in order to achieve what I desire and offer myself to the greater good of this planet. To this, I am devoted. Now, this all sounds nice. <laughs> and believe me, it is nice. It's great. Yet in order to be a skillful teacher, minister, therapist, husband, wife, pro wrestler, whatever, 
One must be able to show a person what to look at, but not tell them what to see. It's tricky. In other words, the temptation to fix is so much more present when one feels that life or the insights that one has gleaned from life have been validated. And we all want to do that. You know, you learn something new and you want to run and share it. <laughs> At times we're like children who have discovered something wonderful that we want to share and then we're disappointed when the gift is not accepted. Why can't they see it the way I see it? Why can't McCarthy handle it the way Reverend Michael would? <laughs> Why can't? Why can't they do y'all? I can't buy you. <coughs> We've all been guilty of this at one time or another. Again, the wisdom of Cahill Gibran. If we were to sit in a circle and confess our sins, we would laugh at each other for our lack of originality. <laughs> <laughs> at times we are so excited that we want, and I still, you can still be right about stuff, don't get me wrong, but when it starts to, I mean, I think Kevin McCarthy is a Shakespearean tragic character, and he can still do damage. I'm not saying, well, I don't say, I'm too spiritual to talk about that. No, no, no. <laughs> but I'm saying that you don't worry about things you can't control and just see him for the wounded person that he is. In any left, right, center, we're up to our you-know-what's in it. That doesn't mean that you can't, there's such a thing as righteous judgment, don't get me wrong. But sometimes we're so far from that. At times, we are so excited that we want the forces of our dear ideas, our insight, or another person, we want it now. We want it at the right gift, at the right time. But perhaps the person doesn't, doesn't want, he doesn't want the gift, or she can't handle her gift, or she can't see. They have a right to that. It is so much more tempting to not allow others to make their own mistakes, or to take away their life lessons in order to be, or appear to be, helpful. I'm just being helpful. I'm just trying to control. I mean, I'm just trying to <laughs> see what I'm talking about. And so, granted, the results of cultivating one's inner life can be very fruitful indeed. And to my mind, they are worth the effort. Yet one must think twice before you move your neighbor's landmark. This is ancient wisdom. Some folk are on a totally different path. And my mom used to tell me, son, you don't burst someone's bubble unless you have something better to replace it with. And because just because someone is wandering doesn't mean they're lost. It is a form of arrogance that causes an individual to feel that it is their particular right to put the entire world in order to close all things open, to make all the crooked paths straight. Such an attitude says that all knowledge and virtue can be contained in a single vessel. Usually that vessel is me. This is a huge mistake. It is always important to remember that one person is never quite in a position to see what other per another person sees. One can never quite be sure how an event an act or a situation is it truly experienced by another person. In short, we do not know the entire inner landscape of another individual. We all have our own landmarks and landscapes. They represent for us the meaning and mystery we have gleaned from walking our own unique path. They represent discoveries that were good for us. Remember, the two most important days of your life, Mark Twain says, is the day you're born and the day you find out why. <laughs> Otherwise, there's no genuine communication between people. If there is not mutual recogni recognition and respect for another's landmarks, you get the world that we have now. To truly know someone is more than just to know their name or to become acquainted with her thoughts. 
It's, it's to really know someone is to know something about what they have gone through and what their symbols stand for, these signs uh, in the traffic of their lives as they journey through their life. In the language of religion, these are the places where the eternal, where the spirit of life, where God, if you will, has been caught and held for a moment in time and in years. Now this may take some uh, spiritual maturity and understanding. Sometimes this can take lifetimes to understand, but yet as Thich Nhat Hanh reminds us, to understand is to love. How can you have love if you don't have any understanding? Think twice before you remove your neighbor's landmark. It's, it's almost time to go. Okay, so I'm gonna leave you with this. Anything that annoys you is teaching you patience. Anyone who annoys you is teaching you patience. Anyone who abandons you is teaching you how to stand on your own two feet. Anything that angers you is teaching you about forgiveness and compassion. Anything that has power over you is teaching you how to reclaim that power. Anything you hate is teaching you unconditional love. Anything you fear is teaching you courage to overcome your fear. And anything you can't control is teaching you how to let go. Let us be open to accepting the truth about ourselves no matter how disturbing and no matter how beautiful it is. Amen. Ashe and blessed be. Okay, y'all, we get now. Um, yes, closing him number one, two, eight. Song of Gratitude. Please stand as you are willing to leave. all differences and which heals all wounds, which puts to flight all of our fears, and which reconciles all who are separated. May that love be with us and in us and among us now and until 2024. And I have a good afternoon.